Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's my privilege to welcome you to this evening's fireside. Um, Brother Anthony Sweat will be speaking to us more about him in a moment. We'd like to start first of all by having a prayer, and that will be by Brother Theo Baker from the Burton Ward. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all the blessings that you've given us. We're thankful that we're all able to attend this tonight to um, learn more about the gospel and to feel welcome with each other. Uh, please bless that we use these lessons for our lives and that um, we're all able to learn from this. And we say things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother Theo, for that prayer. Brothers and sisters, it's a treat for us tonight as we listen to Brother Anthony Sweat who will be talking to us. So I'd like to give you some background on Brother Sweat. This is a little bit of a bio. Brother Anthony Sweat is an Associate Professor of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. He received his bachelor's degree in painting and drawing and his PhD in curriculum and instruction. He is the author of several books, most recently, Seekers Wanted and The Holy Invitation. Anthony is a regular speaker at Latter-day Saint events and conferences. He and his wife, Cindy, are the parents of seven children. For the sweat, time over to you. Hey there, my friends. Uh, my name is Anthony Sweat, and I've been asked to speak to you, the great youth of the Litchfield stake over in England. Look, I even, I traveled all the way there from this view out my office window um, so that I could be close to you. Now, obviously this is just a green screen, but I slapped it on there so that I could uh, feel like I was in your beautiful homeland there, even though I'm clear over in uh, the United States of America in Utah. Well, uh, I wish, hope maybe one day we can meet in person, even though we're far away. I want you to know that I am your brother in the gospel, the restored gospel as um as one of the children of the covenant with you i hope i can strengthen you in the covenant strengthen you in your faith strengthen you to uh, continue to come unto christ follow his teachings make and keep covenants with him so with that being said what i've been asked to speak on and do a little uh recording for you guys on is um developing spiritual self-reliance so I want to share a message with that, and then I'll answer some of the questions that were sent to me. Uh, I want to say up front, when I, I get what's being asked when we say develop spiritual self-reliance. What that means is that you and I personally, the way I interpret it anyway, we personally know how to connect with God um, and, and form our own personal connection with him. Uh, now, that being said, uh, how do we do that? So I'm going to share a screen with you, and I want to give you uh, what I think is the greatest way to do it. The scriptures teach us the greatest way to do it uh, uh, and to develop this sort of spiritual self-reliance. And that's through uh, these three sisters. I hope that's showing up for you. The three sisters of faith, hope, and charity. Uh, these are three great gifts. They are three sisters, three women or they're always associated with women anyway. And I'll kind of show you um, why I'm calling the three sisters uh, to lean on as a whole. So there's all these cool old paintings. Look at this one, Faith, Hope, Charity. Uh, here's another one called Faith, Hope, Charity. They're all holding things, that, you know, this old, uh, beautiful European art. Uh, I like to call this one Faith, Hope, and Boredom. Uh, don't those people look like they're bored out of their minds? Holy cow. But notice how in all these paintings, these women are usually holding something. Uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow on the screen, but uh, uh, the one in the center is holding a cup. That's usually uh, faith. Hope is holding a flower here, like hope to, for something to grow. Charity is usually holding a child, like love. Uh, here's one in an old cemetery. You can see this time faith is holding a cross. Charity or hope is holding an anchor. Hope is an anchor to our souls. Charity again with a child. Sometimes they'll use these three symbols, the cross, the anchor, um, and the heart to symbolize faith, hope, and charity. And you see them in Christian symbols like this. You might even see these on old chapels. If you see that symbol, it's a symbol of faith, hope, and charity as a whole. 
I don't know of any time in the world where there's more of a need for these three great gifts of faith, hope, and charity to help us develop spiritual self-reliance. Here's why. Take a look at this verse right here from the Book of Ether out of the Book of Mormon. Quote, faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. In other words, if you and I can get these three great gifts, it will help produce righteousness in our lives, spiritual self-reliance, spiritual righteousness, almost like a fountain, like it just comes out of you. Uh, I think all of us want righteousness just to come out of us. Well, what's the key? The key is to get these three gifts, faith, hope, and charity. So what are they? How do we get them? Uh, like I said, they're always female. and uh, um, that doesn't mean they're only given to women, but they usually associate them with women. These are my three oldest daughters. Um, and guess what their names are, by the way? That's right. This is Lauren, Reagan, and Jane. Ah, you thought I was going to say Faith, Hope, and Charity, huh? I got you on that one. Now, if you want to name your three oldest daughters Faith, Hope, and Charity, you go ahead. But they're Lauren, Reagan, and Jane. So why... Why did I show you a picture of my three oldest girls? Well, because they are, you know, you guys don't know them, um, but they probably might look like their sisters to you. They share similar DNA. Uh, they have some similar features. They're all exactly five foot three. Oh, sorry, that's in feet. I didn't do it in meters. I have no idea how tall that is in meters. Um, but they're all different too. They, they have some things that are different about them and they have different personalities and different gifts, uh, even though they share the same DNA. That's a lot like faith, hope, and charity. Faith is different than hope and hope is different than charity and charity is different than faith, but they all come from the same source and share some sim similarities. So what are they uh, and how do you get them? Notice this, the relationship. Wherefore, they're mess this is uh, Moroni. Uh, there must needs be faith. And if there be faith, there must also be hope. And if there's hope, there must be charity. They, they relate to each other uh, in this way. Faith produces hope and hope produces charity. So let's start with faith. What is faith? Faith is trust-based action. How do you develop spiritual or self-reliance? Well, you learn to rely on Jesus. You don't learn to rely on yourself. You learn to trust God more than you trust yourself. And you learn to trust him so much that you begin to take action, uh, faith-based action. Think of it like jumping into a swimming pool. Uh, as a dad, when I take my kids swimming, I like to put them up on the side of the swimming pool and tell them to jump to me. And they're usually afraid because fear stops us from acting. Fear is what will stop you from learning to be reliant on God. And they look at the water and they're afraid they're going to drown. And I reassure them and I give them comfort. Uh, confidence, and I tell them I'll catch them, I won't drop them, and uh, they tiptoe to the, the line a little closer, and then finally they get up the courage to jump, and they trust to the point that they take action, and then they look at the evidence. This is the cycle of how we develop the gift of faith, is we trust God to the point that we take action, and then we look at the evidence. So we say something like, I trust that if I obey the word of wisdom, that I will see the positive evidence. And so we trust it, we take the action to obey it, and then we look at the evidence in our lives. Or we say, I trust that if I will obey God's teachings on chastity, uh, then I'm gonna take that action uh, to, to obey that law. And then I'll look at the evidence that comes into my life. And as you do that, you start to develop confidence in God. I, when I catch my kids off the side of the pool, I high five them. And what do you do as a parent? This is parenting 101, by the way. Well, you put them right back up on the side of the pool and then you tell them to jump to you again. Why do you do that? And this time you might even scoot back a little bit. So there's a bigger gap. And by the way, there's always a gap. You want there to be a gap. Sometimes my kids like reach out their hand. I can do this good in a video. They're like reaching out. They're like, dad, like grab me. That looks kind of cool. Like it was sci-fi. Um, but I don't want to grab them. I don't want to hold them. I want there to be a little bit of a gap because when there's a gap, they have to trust me as their father. And after I catch them and high five them, I put them back on the side and I make them jump again and again. And I do this so they develop trust. 
to the point that they're willing to leap at anything I tell them to do. And you guys can already connect the analogy. That's how you develop the gift of faith over and over and over. You trust, you take action, you look at the evidence. So what are you trusting God right now on? What are you not trusting him on? What action can you take? And what evidence have you seen or can see as you trust him? All right, let's talk about hope for a second. What is hope? Well, hope is not a wish. You see this little internet meme here. I don't know if they're as funny over in England as they are here in America. Uh, you know, this says there's always hope that tomorrow night will be taco night. Uh, the way in over here in America, anyway, where we have slaughtered the English language, uh, the way we use the word hope is almost like a wish. Like, I hope that the sun's out tomorrow. I hope it won't be cold. I, I hope that the internet works well. I hope that school gets canceled. I hope that uh, my parents um, make tacos or whatever food it is that, that you want to eat. Well, that's like wishing. And that's not what hope is in the gospel. Okay. Hope is something much more. Hope is this. Hope is that you start to gain a personal assurance in God's promises. The things that God has promised, you start to say, those are mine. And you get them from faith. On the step before, as you trust God and take action and start to look at the evidence, then that starts to confirm you and give you the gift of hope. Like God promises, when he says he won't drop you, he really won't drop you. And you start to gain a personal assurance that uh, those promises are yours. This is uh, uh, the book of um, Moroni says, what is it that you shall hope for? Well, you'll have hope through the atonement of Christ. Uh, in his promises. Uh, I'm, well, hold on. I'm going to come back. I skipped ahead of myself a little quick there. I, let me reiterate this to you. Hope is different than faith. Faith produces hope. Hope's the older sister of faith. Um, and when I start to gain faith, I gain hope because I start to have an assurance. It's different than saying, like, I can say to you, God answers prayers. That might be faith. Hope says God answers my prayers. Uh, you, faith might say God forgives sins, but hope is, no, God forgives my sins. It's personal. So it's a personal assurance of the promises that God has extended in Scripture. Well, the question is, what are then some of the promises that God extends us through Christ? Well, here's six promises of the Savior that, he, that I want you to learn to gain hope in. He promises he'll cleanse you. He promises he'll heal you. That doesn't mean always of sickness. It means that he'll heal your soul so that you're good with mortality, regardless of what happens. You, you gain an inner peace. He'll restore you. Uh, ultimately, he'll restore you in the resurrection. But he'll restore purity to you. He'll restore lost blessings to you. Um, he promises he'll identify with you, meaning he understands you. He, he promises he knows what you're going through. He promises he'll strengthen you to bear up your challenges, to resist temptation, to do good things in life. And he promises that he'll transform you or change you from a bad person to a good one, from a good one to a great one, and from a great one to somebody like God. Now, those are just six of them. There's many more. And when you gain the gift of hope, you start to go, I know God will cleanse me. I know God will heal me. I know God will restore me. He'll identify with me, and he does identify with me. He'll strengthen me, and he'll change me. By the way, a great way to remember these six promises, you see, look at the first letter on each of those six. Notice what it spells. Uh, I'm going to do that again for you. Christ is not just a name. Christ is a power, and it's a power that we're supposed to have hope in. It's a title, Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the one who cleanses, who heals, who restores, who identifies, who strengthens, who transforms. Okay, then what's charity? Well, one, once I gain faith and hope, when I start to gain that hope and I start to see that Jesus and God will do all this for me, man, I start to love them. I start to just feel, have this deep, and I experience how much they love me. And that's what charity is. Charity is not going out and doing nice things for people. 
I would say that's an effect of charity, but it's not what the gift of charity is. Charity is not service. Charity is a loving relationship with God. When you read the scriptures uh, and you read the word charity, I want you to think of it as a loving relationship with God. Originally, the word was the Greek word is agape, which means it's the fatherly love of God for his children and their love for him in return. Notice how that's the Book of Mormon uses it. Again, I remember that thou has said that thou, Jesus, has loved the world, even to the laying down of thy life for the world. And now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. It's God's love for us. And then we, we love God back. Our faith develops hope and our hope develops charity in him. So think of it a two-way relationship. Charity means you know that God loves you and that you then love God in return um, because of that. Or as the book of John says, 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. Okay, you with me? Isn't that cool? Cool, great gift. It's different than service. Now, I don't want to bag on it and say it's not, but it's uh, service is like an effect of charity. If I, if I know how much God loves me, and I've tasted of God's love, and you're filled with that love of God, then kind of like Lehi, when he partook of the fruit of the tree of life and it filled him with God's love, he automatically wanted to share that fruit with others. So you will automatically want to help and serve others. That's an effect of charity. Joseph Smith once said that a person filled with the love of God, charity, is not content to bless his or her own life alone, but is anxious to bless the whole human race. Man, I love Joseph Smith. Hope you do, you do too. And kind of like back to the sisters, the Apostle Paul and in the Book of Mormon, it says the greatest of all gifts is charity because uh, everything else leads us to having charity. Having faith will produce hope, which will produce charity. And if we will have charity, uh, we will be good because we'll love God and we'll love our fellow men. And all the commandments boil down to those two things, don't they? Jesus himself boiled them down to those two things. Do you love God? And do you love your fellow men? Okay. How do we get it then? Well, the Book of Mormon says you and I need to pray unto the Father with all the energy of our heart that we'll be filled with this love. And that God has promised that love is charity, that he'll bestow it upon all who are true followers of his son, Jesus Christ. Follow in faith, develop hope in Christ. You'll experience charity uh, as a whole. And see that you have faith, hope, and charity. And then you will always abound in good works. That's how you and I learn to become spiritually self-reliant. So I want to give you a challenge. Number one, faith. What actions do you need to learn to trust? Or sorry, what teachings do you need to learn to trust that you can take action on? So, and then look at the evidence. As you start to look at the evidence that comes to you from following Christ, then you'll start to get assurance in his promises. That's hope. And what promises do you want to gain more assurance on? And then as you gain that assurance, I want you to pray with all the energy of your heart that you'll be filled with charity. Um, in all sincerity, um, in the mornings when I say my prayers and I get ready to go out for the day, I pray to God to bless me with the gifts of faith, the gifts of hope. And I pray really hard for the gift of charity that I'll feel and know of his love and that I will in turn love him and love uh, my fellow sisters and brothers who I am surrounded with and treat them the way God would want me to treat them. Man, it makes life good to have those three great gifts. Um, I testify that's true to you. Okay. That's what, I, that's my message I want to share. Now I want to answer some of your questions. Let me jump over to those. Okay. First question was, um, how do we develop spiritual self-reliance? Well, that's what I just answered. So I'm not going to touch on that one. How can, second question, how can parents and leaders encourage youth on their personal journey? That's a really good question. Um, parents and leaders, if you're listening to this, the best way you can encourage youth is have the long-term perspective. Uh, um, don't look at them as just teenagers. Teenagers love you, but you're awkward. Um, everybody's awkward when we're teenagers. If you had met me when I was awkward, uh, sorry, when I was a teenager, I was awkward too. I had my issues. I had to figure things out. 
Um, uh, so just encourage them uh, on that. Be patient. Uh, they're all the same cliche answers, but, um, but don't, don't expect them to figure things out uh, right away. Have patience with them and long suffering in the same way God has patience and long suffering with you. Freely forgive. Don't judge. The same way you want God to freely forgive and don't, don't judge you. Um, line upon line. Uh, you know, think of a, uh, one of my friends, Brad Wilcox, has given like par a parable of the piano. Um, you know, when we learn how to play the piano, uh, we don't, we don't figure, we, we make mistakes and we're, we kind of bumble and fumble as we're learning to play, but we're trying. The key is, am I trying? Or I was a basketball player. I don't know how popular basketball is or is, isn't over in England, but over here in America, it's, it, it's the game of the gods. Um, I was a basketball player. And when you play basketball, you don't make every shot. Uh, and we shouldn't expect people to, but we do try to make every shot. So uh, just encourage uh, that way. Okay, um, uh, next question. Where do I turn for peace? Uh, well, that's an easy one. Uh, Jesus himself says he is the founder of our peace. I, I don't find peace in anything except for the promises of the gospel. I don't find peace. Um, I find a lot of things that I admire in society, but none of them give me true peace. The, the peace that surpasses everything is having faith, hope, and charity. Those things give me peace uh, when I have them. Um, how has being spiritually self-reliant blessed my life? Well, one of the ways it blesses my life is I'm not dependent upon how other people feel about something. Um, you know, uh, I don't need to, I don't need to depend on how their views of the gospel or their views of God. I know that I've got my own, um, I don't have to depend on the state of the world or society to have peace. I know that I have peace in Christ. Um, um, well, and, and let me, let me tie that back to peace, by the way. And, and how is it uh, blessed my life? I just had a scripture come to my mind. Doctrine and covenants 19 verse 23. Learn of me. Listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit, and ye shall have peace in me. That was a youth theme a few years ago. Learn, listen, walk, peace. Learn of me. Trust me. Take action. Walk uh, in the meekness of my spirit. Be learn learn to receive that spirit and become receive the gift of hope and charity, and you will have peace in me. That will be the result. Okay, some last questions. Um, a few for me personally. Where do I get inspiration for my painting? So some of you may or may not know I'm an artist. I'm a painter. I paint um, church history and doctrine scenes, Joseph Smith, early restoration. The, where I get inspiration for my paintings is when I learn about something in the scriptures or in our church history that has never really been painted before. That really excites me. Or maybe it's never been painted in a way that uh, I think should be painted. Uh, that's where I get my inspiration. I start going, man, it'd be cool to have an image of that or that looks like that. And, and then I start to paint. And that's, where I, that's where I get a lot of them from. Uh, what's it like to have such a big family? It's awesome. I have seven kids. Yes, yeah, seven. That number is the same in America as it is in, in England. Now I get that uh, every society is different. Um, I'm lucky to live in Utah. Having a lot more kids is not, um, it's not as uncommon. Uh, there's other families around me that have seven kids or eight kids or six kids. Or, and so I don't walk around sticking out and looking different, uh, which helps. But even if I did, I wouldn't care. Uh, one time we took our family, when you get outside of Utah in America and you go to places like New York or San Francisco or, or other places where it's not as common. I remember one time we stayed at a place and these people looked at us and they started counting 
how many kids um, like I, one lady literally went one, two, three, four, five. And then she turned to her husband and goes seven, seven. And I was like, yeah, it's awesome. I am so grateful for every one of my kids. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a big family or that somehow having a big family is better than having a small family. Um, there's blessings and there's challenges to both. But I, do, I am grateful that we have been able to have a big family. Um, uh, and it's, it's just fun. There's always someone to talk to. There's always someone who's crying. There's always someone with a problem, but there's always someone with a solution. There's always someone to do something with. Um, it's amazing that right now my house is this quiet. It's because all my kids have gone to bed finally. Um, okay. When did I realize that this is the career, career that I wanted to follow? It's a great question. Um, so I am a full-time religious educator for the church. I am a professor of religion at Brigham Young University. And uh, I've, I've been a religious educator for the church for 20 years. Uh, and without boring you with my whole life history, you youth, you'll be like, what, you know, what am I supposed to do with my life? That drives me crazy when people ask teenagers that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, nobody knows what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, if you had asked me when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, I wanted to be rich. I knew that. Uh, I wanted to be, uh, maybe I wanted to be a businessman. I didn't, if you would have told me when I was a teenager, you're going to end up becoming a religion professor and an author and a speaker and an artist. Uh, maybe the artist part would have excited me because I've always liked to paint and draw. But um, the other stuff I, did, I didn't know. And it wasn't until I got back from my mission and started going to college to the university. Um, I majored in art in painting and drawing. And I had somebody who said to me, you are a really good teacher. And you should think about teaching for the church full time. And I looked into it. I wasn't sure if that was right, but I looked into it. I had, I exercised faith. I felt some promptings, some directions, some thoughts, some feelings that I, that, that might be a direction that I should look at. And I took the classes and I got the training. And then I did a student, a practicum, a student teaching. And, and then I got hired to teach one class for a whole year, two classes. And then they offered me a full-time job. And then I went on to get a, a master's degree. And then after I got a master's degree, I don't know if it's the same in England, that's two years after a bachelor's. Then I went on to get a PhD, a, a doctorate degree, which is four more years. And um, then during that time, I started to research and I started to write and I started to publish. And I started to speak and things developed little by little. I guess what I'm trying to say is for me, the plan was not laid out from end to beginning. The plan was more like God gave me one thing at a time. And I started working on that. And then as I worked on that one thing in faith, then he kind of gave me a next step and a next step and a next step. And I kept working and I kept having faith and I didn't let fear govern me. Don't let fear govern you. And little by little, my career kind of unfolded. And you for you, youth, yours will unfold also. Step by step, faith by faith, work by work. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's all I'll do for you now. Um, hope that was helpful for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Uh, as I conclude, I bury my testimony. Uh, well, let me say it in different uh, words. I believe very deeply that uh, we have a loving Heavenly Father um, and a loving Heavenly Mother. I believe very deeply in the restoration of the gospel in the last days. I think God is doing a great work on this earth um, to bring about his will on this earth, not just through our church, but through lots of churches and lots of people and lots of institutions. Um, but that doesn't mean that I believe any less that this church is authorized by God to give the covenants of exaltation. 
I believe that very deeply too. Uh, I believe very deeply in Jesus. I believe he is the way. He is the life. He is the truth. Um, I believe that if you and I will come unto him, we'll experience and get the gift of faith and the gift of hope and the gift of charity. And that if we'll follow him, we'll have peace, uh, whether we're in Litchfield, England, or in Provo, Utah. Um, and I uh, send you my love and my best and wish you well. Keep the faith. Keep going. Keep learning. Keep striving. Keep exercising faith. Uh, seeking the gift of hope and the gift of charity. And let that lead you to the fountain of all righteousness where you'll find peace and happiness. And I'll leave that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you later. Thank you, Brother Sweat, for an excellent fire. Thank you, Brother so, Sweat. For an excellent... I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. We'd like to close events this evening by having a prayer given to us by Brother Noah Baker. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, thankful for this day and thankful for the blessing you've given us. And we are grateful that we've been able to hear the testimony of Brother Sweat. And we hope that we can apply it in our lives. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.